Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. It's really a pleasure to see uh, both old um, and new faces um, across our attendees today. We're very excited to wrap up uh, the cycle of our Space Law and Policy Project Group work uh, throughout 2022 to 2023 um, and give you all a chance to hear a bit about our projects um, and all the work that has been done. So, uh, to, uh, Damati, do you mind going to the second uh, slide? So today, um, it would be fantastic. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so today we're going to be going through uh, a bit of an overview of the current uh, teams, the current leadership structure that allowed our project group to uh, uh, really work out throughout the last uh, year to get all of our deliverables that you'd be hearing more about today. Uh, we will be going through uh, a set of presentations from each one of the projects uh, where the co-leads or different members will be presenting the main gist of the work that was done and the main deliverables um, and we're happy to um, uh, you know lead you on afterwards to different links for the deliverables or um, and have the contact information for folks to be able to ask more uh, questions and more details uh, we will be also um, uh, tackling uh, the next cycle in 2023-2024 so uh, giving an overview about the upcoming plans what we're hoping to do in terms of research, professional development, um, and in terms of communications, events, um, and really talk about recruitment uh, for any one of you who is interested in joining us uh, for the next cycle of the work in this group. Um, and we will have a large portion of Q&A in the end um, for uh, anyone who has any questions about SGAC in general or about space law policy or about any of the uh, things that we discussed throughout the, throughout the presentation. Uh, I do want to note in the presentation of projects, uh, please expect about 10 minutes of per project that we'll be talking about uh, these deliverables with a five minutes of Q&A, um, and you will have the Q&A feature allowed on Zoom, so please add any of the questions there. Um, with that, I want to get started, um, Damati, do you mind next slide? Thank you. I want to get started with uh, really a huge thank you for everyone in SLPPG that really made this project uh, happen uh, and made all of these deliverables a success over the last year. I want to start by thanking Alvaro for being an amazing co-lead uh, throughout the last year and really carrying over a lot of the work um, that we're doing throughout different leadership and uh, uh, project management skills. Um, I also do want to thank every single one of our project leads that worked really tirelessly to put the deliverables together to manage the different teams and different members through uh, the different, I guess, uh, 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 obstacles that happened along the way as well. So a big thank you for all of you. Um, big thank you for all the members who worked really hard and making sure um, all of our papers and all of our blog articles and all of our deliverables were uh, done and really did fabulous research um, in fields that many of you are not familiar uh, who are not familiar and so again um, I really uh, hope this project group was able to give you all an insight on space law and policy um, and get you started in this field uh, uh, ever, in a better way. I also really want to thank uh, Demati and David for helping in organizing this event, uh, Pankaj and Ika for coordinating with everyone in the different uh, groups. Uh, I want to thank Nick and Rose and uh, uh, Victoria and Anmol for all the different communications and membership uh, work that you guys have been all doing throughout the year. So again, huge thank you. Um, and I'm gonna give it out to Alvaro to say a few words as well. Oh. Yeah, thank you, Maya. Yeah, not much to add on my on my end, uh, really. Uh, I, I think it's been for Maya and myself a, a year of transition. We transitioned from uh, being research coordinators to the PG co-lead position. And we've been so, so incredibly lucky to do it um, alongside uh, some amazing uh, leadership, uh, core leadership members and coordinators who have helped us, uh, as Maya said, that's the work tirelessly uh, through all of the different challenges that we've had to face. And uh, they've done it with a great attitude and always with a smile. So honestly, it's, it is a privilege. It is my privilege uh, to work with these people. Uh, and again, to all of the project uh, co-leads who have taken the work, made it their own and uh, managed some incredibly important and transformative uh, projects. It's, 
it's really something else to see. And it's uh, something that, you know, really makes me believe that SJC really is creating the next generation of, uh, of, of space leaders. So thank you to everyone, to everyone who's been involved. Thank you to everyone who's uh, been here with us uh, day after day. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to see what the next year is, is, uh, is holding for, for us. <clears throat> Amazing. Uh, thank you, Alvaro. And uh, uh, this is just a snippet of our leadership team uh, throughout the initial part of the cycle. I do want to know we had uh, amazing new coordinators who joined us towards the end of the cycle who will, who will be carrying on uh, the work throughout next year. And uh, we will be talking about later in the slide. But uh, again, big thank you here to uh, Alvaro, Victoria, Nick, and Anmo from the initial cycle who got us got us through the kickstart of the projects. Um, Tamati, next slide, please. And today uh, we will be going, as I mentioned, through the different uh, projects that we were able to carry throughout the first cycle. So in this cycle, we had the opportunity to do a bit of a diverse portfolio of topics related to space law and policy. Um, you had amazing work in commercial space in Africa, Earth observation and human rights, gender equality, and orbit servicing, militarization disarmament, and the UN Copious Compendium, which was done in collaboration with the Space Safety and Sustainability Project Group. So we're really happy to uh, we're, to, to, to have been able to cover this broad range of, of different topics and allow some collaborations across the different SGAC groups. So um, uh, with that said, um, I'm gonna uh, get us started with all the members who will be going through their initial presentations. Um, so uh, we're gonna be starting by UN Copies Compendium. Again, as I mentioned, uh, everyone will have 10 minutes to present followed by five minutes Q&A. Um, please add your questions to the Q&A on Zoom and we're gonna have a timer to keep track of time. Uh, I'm gonna hand it off to Victoria. To Veronica. To oh, Veronica. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me correctly? Yep, we can hear yes. you. Okay, thank you very much. So I assume I'll just tell you that when uh, the the presentation should be going forward with the slides, um, yep. I'm not going to show my screen. Is that correct? Yep, yep. You okay, thank you very much. So, first of all, thank you, Maya and Alvaro, for your support in, in the past year and for having us today. It is a great pleasure to present you the work that, that we have done this year. It has been a challenging but rewarding year, and I'm glad I was part of it. So, I'm going to present what the UNCOPOS group has done in the past year. Uh, okay, let, let's keep this, this slide, please. Uh, so. Now I'm addressing, yes, the, the next one, please. Thank you very much. I am addressing now a matter of increasing significance in our space exploration endeavors, which is the challenge of space debris. With a surge in satellite, satellites and human-made entities in outer space, the vulnerability of uh, to collision and debris generation, especially in low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit has become critical. Collisions led to cascades of debris fragments escalating the density of special detritus. Recognizing this, the international community has established guidelines, notably the Outer Space Treaty, emphasizing responsible national space operations. In 2014, the UN Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space compiled a compendium of space debris mitigation standards. But the traditional command and control regul regulatory paradigm while effective in preventing gross negligence, falls short in fostering a culture of excellence. It secures compliance, but lacks the impetus for actors to go beyond minimal standards. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. So this project explores uncharted aspects of the compendium and delves into non-reported state practices regarding the debris mitigation standards in non uncopo states. Understanding the state of the state-based space regulation is the first step towards innovative solutions. And by adopting hybrid models, we aim to coordinate regulatory efforts comprehensively, compelling responsible actions at every stage. The focus of this project was on the effectiveness of current command and control regulation in mitigating space debris. So using the compendium as our guiding, guiding framework, the ultimate goal was to prevent congestion in space 
as ensuring its accessibility for future generations. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. So our exploration has a dual focus, identifying regulatory shortcomings and actively seeking solutions. Our second objective involves envisioning hybrid models for the future, strategically blending current strengths while eliminating, eliminating weaknesses. Beyond this research, our ultimate goal is a call to action, a new era for responsibility in space activities, from design to consensus disposal. The urgency lies in preventing the unhybrided congestion in our, in our space environment for sustained prosperity for future generations. And this slide, you see uh, a table um, which uh, outlines the, uh, highlights the current national implementation of several, several sorry, notable space debris mitigation guidelines by regions. This level of adoption speaks to each guideline's success in capturing the shared interest interests and goals to, of the member states. And equally, the additional inclusion of, of other international guidelines and industri industry standards demonstrates the priority each of these states plays on developing sustainable best practice in outer space. And this table provides information about the national and international guidelines and standards for telecommunication in var various countries divided by regions. The regions include Europe, North America, Asia, Africa, and each country um, indicates where they followed certain guidelines and standards. Um, and where you see A, it is adoption of the guidelines standards, E is endorsement of the guidelines standards. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So there is, of course, the need for an update in the regulations. Uh, navigating a dynamic technological landscape gives us the reason for um, an update of the regulation, the current the regulations. Three key steps are identified in our work. First one is advancing space debris regulation, refining re rules for celestial bodies, and advocating for industry-led standards over UN regulation. The second one is developing focused and enhanced regulatory to maintain the existing rules for other planets like the Moon and Mars. Of course, we are going uh, in a distant future, but this is something that we need to start thinking about for the future. And the third one is pushing for an industry-led standard as a more effective regulation as opposed to aspirational UN uh, regulation. There are, of course, also other technological reasons to update regulations. You know that space debris is one of the most important problems that we have in outer space at the moment, as the, uh, you know, the possibility to go to the color syndrome, uh, which will, would prevent us to go to space at all. So there are other technological reasons to update regulations with our data sharing, and advent of commercial uh, space situational awareness. Uh, having more data available, it comes with better models, less uncertainty, best situational awareness, and fewer collisions. And so we have also active debris removal, which is coming to, to reality. There are a lot of companies that are actively uh, working toward the active debris removal. And so this is uh, one of the technological reasons to update the regulations. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, yeah, the, this, um, this table refers to what I've, uh, I've said before. Uh, we have now a baseline and the perspective best practice, which is uh, the perspective that we have in the future. Uh, yeah, this is pretty technical. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so in response to the escalating interest in outer space exploration, we, we know that the future of space exploration means uh, going to the moon, going back to the moon, and one day in a less but more distant future, going to Mars. And the first step that we are go globally taking to go back to the moon is the Artemis program led by NASA. And the Artemis program is uh, uh, supported by the Artemis Accords, 
which are the legal framework of the Artemis program. And so these accords, which are proposed by NASA and not uh, decided with the other state partners, the state partner states just accepted the Artemis Accords. Uh, and so this is uh, the US vision of the relationship between, between humans and space that has been accepted by the states that are now partner of the Artemis program. And this is pretty interesting uh, from a legal point of view because this is a change in the paradigm of the decision uh, rule in uh, international law, as international law is generally uh, decided in, in the competent forum, which is the United Nations. And now we have uh, an accord, which is a paradigm, uh, again, that has been uh, proposed and accepted. And so the, the future, uh, the near future of space exploration will be pretty much guided by the UN vision of the relationship between human and cosmos. But in any case, uh, this is a set of principles guiding international cooperation for the peaceful and sustainable exploration of celestial bodies, in principle the moon, but it also includes Mars one day. And these principles, which are rooted in the other space treaty, but in some senses they try to overcome the other space treaty, which again, it is pretty old, so it is not a surprise that the states, in the lack of a decision from the United Nations, start ruling um, on uh, matters that are not uh, technically national um, competence. Uh, they they want to um, try to prevent outer space heritage and the conflict of activities, like it was said in the uh, Arab Treaty. But in some senses, they try to overcome it. Uh, for example, for what concerns private property, on uh, the establishment of uh, speed, uh, safety zones, and so on. So, coming back to the uh, space debris regulation, addressing the sorry, just just a quick reminder that um the ten minutes of presentation time is up. If you want to wrap up uh, in a minute or so, okay, uh, there is, and we can we can uh, move on to some Q and A that people have for you. But feel free to continue for the next minute. I, or I two. can I can go to the conclusion. No problem. Just skip this slide. If you can. Okay, this is a wrap up of what I've said before. Okay, uh, one minute for the conclusion, and then I will uh, finish my presentation. So, space based regulations face challenges, of course, in effectively mitigating space debris due to the limitation of international space law, as I said, and the fragmented regulatory landscape, which is driven by individual sovereign states' control over the space activities which hinders the establishment of universally accepted debris mitigation strategy. Uh, international guidelines rely on voluntary adherence, resulting in varying commitment levels. And the dynamic space industry requires a more flexible regulatory framework, as state-based regulations struggle with bureaucratic processes and information failures, particularly in developing nations. And so, to finish this presentation, ensuring responsible behaviors and integrating sustainability as a fundamental prerequisite for space ventures is essential. Uh, sorry for running uh, <laughs> my time, and thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, and I think we have five minutes for Q&A. We have one question already on the chat. And then we have Mark uh, with hand raised. So we'll start with a question in the chat uh, from Tom. Uh, how does the copious compendium explore the implications of the Artemis Accords uh, being NASA based rather than UN based? And what considerations and recommendations are put forth to ensure international cooperation and compliance and lunar exploration activities uh, given the unique uh, organizational framework? Okay, thank you very much for this question. And as I said before, the compendium is dated 2014. And at the time, the Artemis Accords were not even in place. So the compendium do not um, effectively address the, the Artemis Accords because it, it came later in time. Um, at the moment, one of the most important problems in uh, the international forum of legislation, which are the UN, is the lack of the possibility to go through effective uh, resolutions. Because, you know, 
the geopolitical situation at the moment is pretty difficult and the it is uh, the same region uh, reason why uh, we um, we still stuck with the other space treaty which is uh, 60 years old uh, it is very difficult to innovate uh, when you have to put together very difficult uh, very different um, sensibilities but also interests uh, and so um, we try to evolve uh, space law without really um, innovating what is in the past and uh, of course there is the need to um, try to, to find a balance between the need to to go in the future and to start with the regulations and the, the very core principles of space law and the core principle of space law cannot be changed because uh, we want to do endeavors in space it mm -hmm. is important that the right forum which are the united nations talk about the future and the current status of space debris but also space law in general yeah. and so yeah cooperation is important cooperation should be in the united nations cooperation in my opinion should be in um, an entity uh, created under the united nations uh, to work on space law uh, effectively but this entity isn't it hasn't been constituted as of today so it is one of the possibilities to enhance cooperation in outer space in the future but no the on to, to answer your question no the on does not uh, ex explicitly uh, address the artemis accords because it w was uh, established later in time awesome. Thank you, Veronica. And the last, I think, two minutes, uh, Mark, uh, you can have your question. And hopefully, I don't think we'll be able to do more than that. Uh, but Mark, feel free to unmute and ask. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all, because I was on this unit space in 1999, where the space generation was grounded. And we never thought that it was become so big. And you're the best uh, practice of uh, cooperation worldwide. So I thank you all for that. And uh, the space debris is a very critical thing at the moment. And uh, I think the national framework is what you can work on because I'm from Germany and we are doing a national space strategy and space law. And we will become an EU space law too. And uh, every nation has to do its own duty because it's all about jurisdiction and control. I'm a space lawyer. So uh, that's all about, and that's even the problem with all the space debris, because if we want to do space debris recycling, what is one of the best things we could do to smelt it again and use it again in space, so we don't have to get all this package over us. And so my question is, how can we get rid of the control which the power who sent it who doesn't really have it in, with space debris. You can say you lose your jurisdiction because you don't have control anymore and something like a bone and everybody can pick it up and mix it up again. But we need a solution for that. So my question is, what would you see as a legal framework for space debris recycling? Thank you very much for your question. I'll, I'll try to be as fast as possible because I, I know we run out of time. Uh, at the moment, everything that is in space belongs to this, the, the launch state. So even if it is a, a very small de uh, debris, uh, everything that happens with or caused by that debris falls under the jurisdiction of this its launching state. Of course, it is very difficult to track uh, little fragments uh that that may also cause um risks and collisions so it is pretty difficult but um when it comes to the possibility to do adr uh it is a complex and you i agree with you it is very complex because if uh, uh, a different comp a, a company that comes from a different state um, than the launching state uh all the activities that 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 particular um, company uh, doing ADR uh, carries out in space are under the jurisdiction of the other state. And so it is very complex. 
and this is one of the most important themes that um, the space sector should be talking about because it is uh, uh, in, something that will come into reality in a very near future and that can be very um, impactful uh, when it comes to the space economy. So yeah, it will bring a lot of money and I think that money will move uh, uh, maybe a little bit faster decision in this sense. Awesome. Thank you so much, Veronica. And thanks again for a great presentation. Uh, so uh, a big round of applause uh, virtually for, for Veronica, but we're going to move on to the next presentation uh, for commercial space in Africa. So feel free to Mari to uh, move to the first slide of it. But thanks again, Veronica. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I want to be sure that everybody can hear me. We can hear you perfectly. Yes. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so my name is Nifemi, and with Jessica, we were colleagues for the Commercial Space in Africa team. And before I go into the presentation, I want to say a very big thank you to Jessica. I couldn't have asked for a better colleague. It was really tough, but you're a really great colleague to have. So thanks for all your help. And I would also say a big thank you to everybody in the team. For days you didn't feel like showing up and you did, a very big thank you. Well, at the tail end, and I hope I do justice to presenting our research. So um, if you move, if you could go to the next slide, please. So for our team, we had two major milestones. And the first was a web a webinar we held in June 20, July 27, if I'm correct, but the summer of 2023. And it was a webinar with the Moon Village Association on benefit sharing of lunar resources activities for Africa. If you are interested in that, it was a pretty interesting webinar. And thanks to everybody who participated. We have it up on YouTube, so please feel free to watch. And I'm going to use the last couple of minutes to just talk about the research. So our research looks at best practices framework for developing space legislation in Africa. And how I would explain it is that the research took a three-part approach to exploring and highlighting what exactly are the best practices framework for developing space legislation in Africa. I believe you can move to the next slide. So, okay, I'm past this. Okay, this just speaks briefly on the webinar. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the first part of our research looked into a cost-benefit analysis of commercial space activities in Africa. What exactly does this mean? We're highlighting Africa's economic landscape and, and technically looking at the potential drivers for Africa's commercial space sector. Because, I mean, I'm Nigerian, I'm African, so it's important that we show what exactly is the economic landscape of Africa and why should Africa even care about space and space commercialization and developing legislation to drive this commercialization. So our research explored a compelling case for leveraging the vast opportunities that are offered by space sectors across Africa. And we further drew up an implementation and action plan that provides a strategic roadmap that emphasizes the role of a couple of things, which includes coordination, investment, education, and regulatory frameworks to maximize the positive impacts of space activities, you know, as Africa continue, continues to embark on its transformative journey into the space age. So that was the first part of the research, technically a cost-benefit analysis of commercial space activities. The second part of the research explores best practices, delving more into the topic for space commercialization in Africa and particularly was drawing on recommendations on the experience of key space actors globally. And by exploring the general characteristics for adopting a national legislative framework, you know, our research further looked at the case for cooperation again among African countries, so pretty much intra-African cooperation, particularly leveraging the African Space Agency as a channel for building continental cooperation and infrastructure to complement national efforts. Now, on our recommendations for a sustainable space regulatory framework for Africa, our research examined the adoption of IP and patent laws for adequate protection adapted to the long cycles of the space sector. 
Also, our research recommends the creation of an efficient and safe licensing system, because it's important for space commercialization to have a very efficient and sustainable licensing system coupled with well-rounded framework for export controls and promotion of investments in Africa's space sector for Africa's socioeconomic development. Now, the last part of our research, which is the third part of the research, examines current international and regional instruments to support African countries in developing relevant and sustainable space legislation that promotes economic development, particularly as a team under the Space Law and Policy um, group and as a lawyer myself, it's important. I know what kind of role the law plays in making people conform. I imagine how chaotic the world would be without laws. So, which is what after we've looked at the economics of space and why it's even why Africa should care about it, the last part very deeply talks into technically the role of the law and how it's important for a lot of African countries to develop relevant and sustainable space legislation that promotes economic development, indigenous capacity building and cooperation for enhancing the benefits of space exploration and space technologies for Africa's development. It's, I want to make um, another deep emphasis on indigenous capacity because we all know that very huge to space is also the defense side of things. And for any country to be an active player to play very effectively to protect its territory. It's important to develop indigenous capacity. There's only so much reliance that Africa can, can place on the international community because eventually when it comes down to it, it's important to have intra-African cooperation and indigenous capacity development, particularly leveraging the younger next generation of African Africans in space. Finally, I'll wrap up by saying that through collaboration, innovation, and a steadfast commitment to enhancing the benefits of commercial space activities, we very much believe that Africa stands ready to unveil its boundless potential globally. And that would be um, tying up our research. I'm happy to know that I'm still in time. I hope my presentation was as clear as possible. And I hope you don't have questions, but if you do, I'll be happy to take them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nifemi. And big thank you also to Jessica and the team for making this amazing work happen. Uh, we do have three questions on the chat, and I think we have uh, enough time and uh, uh, five minutes plus the remaining uh, time from your presentation. So we're going to start by Tom's question. Uh, what are the current uh, development and future prospects for commercial spaceports in Africa, and how do they contribute to the continent's participation in the global space industry? Um, what are the current development and future prospects for commercial spaceports? Um, I would say that that was not that was beyond the ambit of our research, to be honest, at this point. So I wouldn't say I have the clear cut answer to that. That would be an interesting research to further take on. But I believe that spaceports very much contributes to Africa's participation globally. But um, my own dissent to that would be that. Africa first needs to develop its capacity. And the truth is first, maybe even beyond developing its capacity is first to see the need. Because trust me, I, I went to make I have a degree in space law. And a lot of people says to me, there are a lot of problems on the earth. Why should we care about space? That's still the ideology of many people in Africa. So it's first important that people even see the need to care about space. And I say to people, the only reason why here is because there's space. The reason I get up from my house and say, I don't know where I'm, I don't know the way to my destination, but I'll use Google Maps is because there's satellites in space that help me. The reason I can call my mom in Nigeria and speak to her before this call is because the satellites in space that aid that. So first of all, for Africa, there's a lot of development internationally, but there's the need to first make the people understand why we should care about space, understand the role of the law in even helping us develop proper legislation for space. I think very much before we can move into things like spaceports and launches and all of that. All right, um, we have another question. I'm gonna move to Emeka's first and then go to uh, the second question by Tom, just to give everyone a chance to ask, uh, what legal framework and governance is appropriate for commercial space legislation in Africa? 
And Absolutely. if we can keep the um, answers attached short, so we can have a bit more uh, opportunities for all questions. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Emeka. I wish there was a straight cut answer to that. But I would say first that there isn't a one size fit all approach to it. But what I believe that Africa needs, first of all, Africa has some of the best lawyers in the world. So the legal framework and governance that is appropriate for commercial space legislation in Africa, I would say is first one that leverages cooperation. And if you look at in the spirit of the African philosophy on Ubuntu, you know, we are because you are. Africa needs first framework that leverages on its own capacity development, looks into investment, intra-African development, leveraging external partners, a proper licensing framework, because with a proper licensing framework also helps with issues of liability. So I would say a framework that covers intra-African development, cooperation and development with and partnership with external bodies and a, a more sustainable licensing framework, which also encapsulates mm -hmm. things like export controls, IP patent laws. Mm -hmm. And your, your answer ties uh, nicely to uh, the question that Tom asked, which is how is Africa positioning itself to leverage space uh, resources for economic development and what potential partnerships or projects are on the horizon in uh, the realm of uh, space resource use? Yeah, Africa is doing a lot of work. I see um, I see Tando's comment on um, the space port on the coast of Kenya. Which is which first? Thank you, thank you so much for that. That's really great to know. Which is first answers that question. It shows you that there's so much that Africa is doing in space. Nigeria has satellites in space. There are a lot of African countries that have launched satellites in space. There's also the work that Starlink is trying to do to bring like its internet to different parts of Africa. Africa is doing a lot of work in space, um, especially with the creation of the African Space Agency. That's also that's also a critical agency to further drive Africa's um, participation in space. And that agency uh, and the work of the African Union also, especially with the Agenda 2063, which is key to driving you know, space commercialization, Africa's space, Africa's efforts in space. So I would say currently Africa is leveraging a lot of um partnership with foreign bodies, especially at the realm of affairs of the African Union which I believe should flow very deeply to each member state because there's only so much African Union can do. If the member states don't you know, align, then we probably won't gain a lot of effort. But Africa is doing so much. It's leveraging its position, especially with the African Union and the body on its own is doing a lot with international partners and organizations. And yeah, I believe that the next space race, Africa will be, we play a critical role. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nifemi, Nifemi again, uh, for all the amazing work. And thanks for all the team uh, for this uh, for this great research and the webinars and all the deliverables. Uh, we're going to move on to next presentation. Thank you. I'm going to drop off. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Disarmament. Uh, I believe, David, if you want to take over. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to finally be able to present to you all the uh, research from the space militarization and disarmament teams um, study into the non-peaceful use of commercial satellites. Um, so if we could change, I think it's two slides over from this. Uh, no, maybe not in this version. Back one. Back one. Okay, yeah, I'll just go forward. I think it's changed slightly, but okay. So. What we wanted to do, so we wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of and gaps in the current laws and policies available to address the increasing militarization of commercial activities, uh, commercial space activities, and analyze both the strategic and policy implications of this increased utilization of commercial satellites in conflict scenarios. Um, so we wanted to combine our both legal and policy perspectives uh, to enable us to make certain proposals to address the current gaps and challenges and really to understand some of the the main obstacles that are preventing this regulation uh next slide please uh so 
we divided up the research um, based on these sort of main competencies that everyone has and based on the interests of members of the group. Um, and um, yeah, so we, we met all of the deadlines on time. Thank you uh, to Alvaro and Maya for uh, helping us out with it and for all your feedback during the course of the project. Um, really through this sort of innovative approach of combining the two perspectives, we were able to bounce ideas off each other and really sort of work out the specifics of the project. Can you move on to the next slide? And yeah, so changed order. Uh, next slide, please. Cool. So um, the introductory sections of the paper really sort of painted the scene um, of increasing space militarization, increasing use of commercial satellite data to support strategic military objectives. And then the bulk of our analysis is divided between this legal analysis in section two and the policy perspective in section three. And we conclude them by setting out recommendations for potential avenues of future development. Next slide, please. So to start with the legal perspective, uh, next slide. So Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty confirms the application of general principles of international law to the space environment. So therefore, we focus not just on the space treaties and how they may be applied to space militarization, but we also took a look to general principles of international law, which play an ever-increasing role uh, due to the difficulties of achieving consensus and developing new principles of space law. So it's important to consider, therefore, alternative systems of space governance due to that difficulty in obtaining consensus. So we also consider soft law and even academic discourse and engagement, such as the NATO Talon Manual. Beginning with the space focus rules. Um, Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty prohibits the placement of weapons of... Next slide. Um, prohibits the placement of weapons of mass destruction in orbit or on celestial bodies. And Article 9 of the same treaty obliges states to have due regard to the impact of their activities um, on the activities of other states. However, these provisions have inherent limitations, uh, the former being of limited scope and the latter being incredibly vague and difficult to apply in practice. A similar prohibition of interference can be found in Article 45 of the Constitution of the International Telecommunications Union, which has a clear application in the case of electromagnetic interference with satellite operations, but it suffers from the same problems as the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty. It's generically formulated and leaves a lot of open questions. The Registration Convention also plays an important role in identifying those with control of satellites, but I'll emphasize later it does not in itself provide a full picture of who is actually using a satellite and for what. Next slide, please. We really emphasize the application of the peremptory norm contained in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, obliging states to refrain from the use of force in their international relations, and how that could be applied to different uses of satellites in conflict or to attacks against satellite systems. The NATO Talent Manual identified that this provision could be applied to cyber attacks against satellite systems, and academics have identified several criteria that can help us to understand whether the severity of an attack against a satellite rises to the level of a use of force, thus allowing a state to rely on its right of self-defense. It's critical uh, that we have this continued academic dialogue um, to help us to better understand provisions that were written long ago and not really intended to be applied to these types of scenarios. Next slide, please. So the use of commercial satellites in armed conflict also raises several key questions for international humanitarian law, which obliges combatants to distinguish between civilian and military uh, targets. Only military targets are legitimate targets. This is an intransgressible principle of international law but it's difficult to apply due to the dual, often dual use nature of modern commercial satellites where sometimes the data will be used by military bodies and some other times for commercial satellites. We see that for instance, through uh, Starlink. Uh, next slide, please. The legal position on the use of satellite data requires especially careful scrutiny as to when it's used to target attacks meets the threshold necessary to give states recourse to the right of self-defense. 
And ultimately, we concluded that the use of such data in information warfare is of sufficient gravity um, and could be considered contrary to Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, thus giving states access to their right of self-defense. Um, but we welcome any scrutiny of that conclusion, of course. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions. Next slide. Um, the current policy environment helps to shed light on the potential pathways for future development. Commercial satellite imagery and communications technologies have been seen to become increasingly widely available on the commercial market in recent years. But despite this, there's a lack of awareness of the threat that this poses. Recent examples of the use of such imagery can be seen in the 1991 Gulf War, or recently in analyzing military operations in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen examples of these sorts of images on Twitter. Next slide. Export controls and such technology were spurred by the Cold War, and it was marked by a combination between multilateral and unilateral efforts. The multilateral framework remains voluntary, which is a bit of a weakness to its development. It is also based on the existing national controls rather than providing effective international management or enforcement capabilities. Next slide. These issues will only become more important in the years ahead. There are over 3,000 orbiting satellites um, today, and only 501 are identified for military purposes. I hope that our research sheds a light that it's not just these overtly recognized military satellites that are actually being used for military purposes. Um, so if we could move then on to our conclusions, because time is running short. So we recognize that the current framework leaves a lot of terms undefined or unfit for the modern context. Improvements in the registration convention are definitely essential to increase transparency, but updating this will prove difficult due to um, the challenge of obtaining consensus through the UN. Humanitarian law must also be revisited in light of the new challenges faced by dual use satellite systems. Uh, our policy conclusions highlight that the existing framework has always seen difficulties of enforcement, and with increased use of data, it will only become more difficult uh, due to the difficulty of demonstrating a direct connection between use of the data and whatever atrocity was committed. So we propose two solutions to deal with the challenges. Uh, despite the political situation not allowing for the adoption of a treaty at this time, a UN assembly resolution could serve as a useful starting point for the discussion. An additional policy option at state level would be to discourage private entities from exporting data to states with a record of violating human rights, potentially based on Article 25 of the Rome Statute. But a uniform approach really would be beneficial, and this will only develop gradually through proactive discussions. Um, so in that vein, thank you for listening to my presentation today, and I welcome any questions that you have. Amazing. Thank you so much for a great presentation as always, David. Uh, and I do want to note that uh, David has presented this work of the group at the IAC this year at the International Astronautical Congress. So uh, uh, definitely, uh, you know, big thank you for all the team for such a great deliverable. Uh, we're going to move on to questions. I do encourage everyone who's listening to the presentations to submit uh, their questions on the chat. Uh, thanks again, Tom, for uh, submitting the questions after uh, each one of the presentations. Uh, so uh, the, the question that Tom has is, are there considerations or provisions that specifically address the impact on indigenous peoples? Um, how can these legal structures ensure responsible and equitable use of satellite technology, taking into account the rights and interests of indigenous communities, especially with regard of dark and quiet skies? I, so this wasn't a question that we explicitly addressed in our research. So our main focus was on the use of satellite data um, and for military purposes rather than sort of equitable distribution. But it definitely is a legitimate concern in terms of how we can ensure that the resources that we're getting from space are distributed equally. Um, we didn't explicitly address it in this. In my time, I haven't come across any international provisions that have been agreed to ensure this balance. There are a few sort of UN General Assembly resolutions that call for you know, equitable access to space, making sure that we have sharing of resources, but you always have the debate around what sharing resources actually means and 
actually getting SITs to give up the resources and share them with others is, yeah, it's incredibly difficult, but something that we definitely need to see more of. Alvaro? Yeah, sorry, on this question, I just wanted to say that um, our project group has actually um, done work uh, looking at how uh, satellite data impacts indigenous communities, um, especially, uh, well, Maya can tell you all about it. She was uh, leading the project. Uh, she 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 knows much more than I do. Uh, and we also have uh, we had this year our team on Earth observation and human rights, who was also looking at this uh, this uh, kind of idea of how Earth observation impacts, uh, especially indigenous communities. Um, so that's definitely a great question that may not have been um, you know looked at by the disarmament team, but this is definitely something that we are very interested in our, in, our, in our PG and keep on investigating year after year. Yep. Um, and to answer your question, Tom, about if we can share some sources on the matter, of course, we can definitely follow up um, on any uh, uh, specific details um, and reports and presentations that were done. Um, there's also a previous uh, group uh, led by Juliana Rotala, who was uh, specifically tackling dark and quiet skies and satellite constellations. So uh, that is uh, definitely a great uh, project with deliverables to look at um, if you're interested. Um, I think there's one question that uh, from Rajat. Um, how can citizen science help address global consensus and how can we bring awareness to the dual use of satellite of satellites um, to the broader public? Uh, so maybe we can take this last question, David. Um, so it, it varies really by country. Of course, a lot of the data on how satellites are being used is public source. It's on available on international registries, on national registries. In a lot of countries, whenever public procurement happens, they have to put out on openly online on websites, at least the general synopsis of what it is that they're looking for. So you can see the sorts of technologies that states are starting to try and develop both from a civil and you can think from a potential military perspective as well. Um, but the problem that we highlighted really was that the purpose that a satellite is sort of registered for isn't always necessarily the ultimate purpose that it ends up being used for. So Civil registered satellites, satellites that are predominantly registered for a civilian purpose, may end up being used for a military purpose. Um, that's really difficult to try and prove from a, a sort of citizen scientist type perspective. But I think just on trying to highlight the issue more, uh, trying to yeah share more online uh, and read more about the subject, it's it's definitely very enlightening and just by lobbying policymakers you can yeah definitely make a huge impact awesome thank you so much again david for a great presentation and great questions oh victoria all right this is more um a comment than a question but i don't know if you've seen any of the movement like in the us so the us space force um i don't know if they put it out yet but they're actually creating a commercial strategy <laughs> for how to incorporate commercial capabilities within defense uh, within the space force so and they're doing this under the similar framework and that they think about um, how do we incorporate commercial um, capabilities for when we go to war in other parts um, in other senses not in space so i know in the us there's already a lot of conversation and a lot of commercial companies um, don't necessarily actually have a problem with that because there's a ton of funding coming from the US government, specifically the Space Force. So, so I think we're gonna start seeing more and more of that kind of cascading into other countries. So it'll be really interesting for you to look back on this maybe in a couple of months and see how things are shifting, probably not in the direction that you want it to be going, but really good research. <laughs> I'm just, unfortunately I see it going in the direction that probably we, we wish it wouldn't be going into. Yeah, sounds like a sounds like a great topic for the next cycle to to tackle the <laughs> the next steps following that. But uh, yeah, and I do believe there was a report, uh, the one that you mentioned, Victoria, that I that was out. So um, we could uh, for for all of the folks that are part of our mailing list and things, we can uh, constantly send out resources, which will include things uh, reports such as that. Um, and um, um, okay, we're gonna move on to next presentation. All right, Earth Observation Human Rights. Ali, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Maya and everyone. Um, we, that's right. Um, I'll be quick because I know we're short on time. So um, at the 
and our project group, we focused on the role and challenges of VO technologies, uh, specifically in the case of the Beirut explosion and the assessment and relief responses that followed. As you may know, the Beirut explosion is one of the most tragic singular events in the 21st century. It's the largest non-nuclear explosion in history um, caused by the detonation of more than 2,700 tons of dangerous ammonium nitrate. A um, lot of technical oversight, failures to enact preventative laws and policies, and you know, tragically, as we can see, claiming the lives of hundreds of people, as well as uh, thousands of injuries, and you know, destroying much of the infrastructure and businesses. Um, what's interesting for us is how the international community responded, um, what the implications were for human rights, and um, what role did Earth observation technologies play in that event as sort of a case study. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, basically, we think that a, co a coordinated mechanism integrating remote sensing and proper regulations could potentially have minimized the devastation. As you will see, th this was applied in various instances, but you know our paper is here to sort of improve upon that situation. Looking at the explosion as a case study, we ask, um, are Earth observation technologies being leveraged for humanitarian responses following such events? What the current international initiatives are that regulate or promote the use of EO in humanitarian emergencies? What challenges on the legal and technical level exist in the utilization of EO in humanitarian responses? <laughs> And how can policy and international cooperation be optimized and leveraged to ensure that satellite technology is effectively and ethically used in humanitarian crises? So uh, next slide, please. To address these research questions, we began by sourcing EO data through image processing to comprehensively assess the extent of the damage. We reviewed the ways in which EO data was harnessed in response to the disaster, namely as it relates to the infrastructure, search and rescue operations, as well as relief and reconstruction efforts. This initial groundwork enabled us to conduct a review of current domestic and international legislation governing remote sensing activities in this case, including the challenges that arise in their implementation. The insights gained also serve as a valuable foundation to comment on human rights violations. Next slide, please. Um, big amount of literature, but you know what we essentially wanted to draw your attention into is on three levels. Internationally, we looked at the Charter on Cooperation um, to achieve the use of space facilities in the event of natural or technological disasters, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, remote sensing principles, of course, as well as very interestingly, transparency and confidence building measures in such an event. On a national level, we identified two laws and a preamble in the constitution which are relevant, the most relevant of which was the Lebanese telecommunications law. We looked at various human rights reports. Perhaps the most impactful is the one by Human Rights Watch titled, They Killed Us From The Inside. Um, next slide. Going forward with the work, we divided our teams into three sections, namely technical, legislation, and human rights. Uh, next slide, please. Technologies emerging from Earth observation became a true lifesaver in the realm of humanitarian aid. The activation of Charter paved the way for leveraging satellite imagery with Sentinel satellites emerging as reliable data-driven allies in this notable cause. EO data played a crucial role in offering vital insights for damage assessment. Employing Worldview 1 and 2, coupled with NASA's ARIA's color-coded imagery, presented a creative and effective analysis of the inflicted damage. Next slide, please. The scene unfolded with significant environmental damage, meticulously assessed through the lens of EO data. A collaborative venture between NASA and Singapore's Earth Observatory utilized a dispersion model to monitor the close post-blast environment, with the Khalifa satellite leading the way in pinpointing vulnerable hotspots. Revitalizing an area that is ravaged by a blast is a formidable challenge on all fronts, yet EO made it more manageable. ARIA and Worldview seamlessly provided guidelines, laying out essential steps to facilitate reconstruction efforts, which breathe black the life into the affected regions. Next slide. Coming to the model framework, this model framework is our own work that demonstrates how we can attempt to address this issue. The imagery provided by Airbus DS using plates data 
underwent processing employing a grayscale technique to simplify color complexity and visualize the scenario. Adaptive thresholding isolated the explosion, enhancing segmentation and kind of precise uh, thresholding identified the specific region of interest, which was the explosion area. This analysis served as a benchmark for advancing images from various agencies, facilitating differentiation of subjects and enabling diverse feature analysis. It's a testament that even the novices like us can embark on journey of mirroring the feats of the esteemed. Now I would like Lakita to take over. And next slide, please. Thank you, Prasad. Turning to the domestic and international initiatives, on the domestic front, there are no explicit provisions for remote sensing regulation. However, some of the provisions found in the current legislation can inform a future framework. Potential grounds may be found in Section G of the Preamble to the Constitution, the Lebanese Telecommunications Law, which addresses data services, and the Environmental Protection Law, which guarantees citizens' right to access environmental information regarding damages resulting from the explosion. Turning to the international framework, the International Charter, activated immediately after the explosion, facilitates a coordinated response using satellite data to assist affected states during and after disasters. The remote sensing principles directly address remote sensing activities. In recognition of the asymmetric capabilities of diverse states, they reaffirm state sovereignty and call for information disclosure to aid in disaster management. Finally, the transparency and confidence building measures are non-binding and voluntary measures that aim to foster cooperation among states as exemplified in existing agreements such as Article 11 of the Outer Space Treaty 1967. Next slide, please. Turning to human rights considerations, Lebanon has ratified various human rights instruments and enshrined some of these rights in its constitution. However, allegations of breaches of these rights have been leveled against their officials following the explosion. It was alleged that the awareness of the dangers of storing ammonium nitrate at the port amounted to a failure to act to prevent foreseeable risks to life in violation of the right to life. Allegations were also made regarding the stalling of the investigation in contravention of the right to life and therein enshrined effective remedy, which includes an impartial, independent, prompt, credible, transparent, thorough, and effective investigation. Additionally, there were claims of a violation of the right to an adequate standard of living, which requires that Lebanon foresee and protect basic needs, including food, clothing, housing, and the improvement of living conditions. Given that there were reportedly over 180 schools that were damaged by the Beirut explosion, the right to education was impacted as well. Next slide, please. Um, in the context of issues and challenges that can arise, we've focused on three areas. So the absence of legislation, the lack of a legally binding instrument at the international level means that states must enact legislation at the domestic level. As states are likely to have different interpretations of international rules, this is in turn likely to create inconsistent rules across jurisdictions, which can also hinder accessibility of data within a humanitarian context. Secondly, in terms of national security and sovereignty concerns, remote sensing provides global access, which can potentially compromise the security and sovereignty of states. Such access to the natural resources and wealth of a state by external entities may undermine the state's sovereignty. The commercialization of high resolution remote sensing imagery exposes the risks that arise from the dual use nature of this data in that they can be used for humanitarian and military purposes. The absence of policies, best practices, and strategies can disadvantage emerging spacefaring states as it undermines coordinated response and hinders the effective harnessing of EO data. Finally, the imposition of restrictive data sharing rules by developed spacefaring nations can also produce similar effects. And turning to the data protection and privacy concerns, this technology can capture sensitive information about individuals and critical infrastructure which infringes privacy rights and rights to protection of personal data. The difficulty of affording such protection is exacerbated by the imperative of providing timely and rapid access to remote sensing data, the sheer volume of data generated, and the limited resources of some of those handling this data in this context. Next slide, please. 
In conclusion, EO data is crucial in crises as it can enhance humanitarian response efforts. However, an enabling environment must be created to provide the appropriate regulatory framework for its implementation. The current legal regime lacks clarity and does not address key issues regarding remote sensing activities, which has led to a lack of coordination in response efforts. Next slide, please. Looking to the future, these are a few recommendations which will enable stakeholders to secure EO data management, enhance human rights protection, and improve humanitarian response. Enact and update legislation, integrate TCBMs and remote sensing principles, implement a Creative Commons license, and align technologies with a proper legal framework. Next slide, please. These are a few of the key resources we used for our research. And the next slide, it's a list of our team members, um, but that's the end of our presentation. So thank you for your time. And we now open the session for your questions. Uh, one more slide, please. Sorry, one more slide. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, right. Thank you, Ali, Lakita, and Pankash for uh, uh, sorry, not Pankash, uh, Prasad for all the for all the incredible work and for the great presentation of all the different aspects. Uh, this is uh, uh, incredibly important work, and the EO kind of world of, uh, of of discussions has been something our project group has been interested in over the last few cycles, and we're happy to continue uh, that going forward. So. Uh, I know Tom asked a question that was kind of answered, so we're going to start with Mark's question. Um, how can we use Earth observation to come in front of the disasters to prepare, therefore, and create more space for sustainable development goals, actions? Anyone on the team, feel free to Rebecca? hop on. Rebecca, feel free. Hi, guys. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think data observation has a crucial role to play in terms of addressing um, issues ranging from disaster management. And um, I think the best way is for the country uh, to be involved and domesticate most of the international laws from an international perspective. So those laws need to be domesticated in the law. Now, when we're actually um, analyzing um, the laws in Lebanon, uh, our findings reveal that um, they don't have more like adequate laws. Um, to cover for it observation, and it's part of the recommendations we added. So um, in terms of um, it observation for um, disaster management and other uh, um, explosions that may come up in the future, I think the best is for them to just first of all domesticate laws and try as much as possible to engage in uh, transparency and confidence building measures. This will help to improve and sensitize them various areas that has to do with test observation. Technically speaking, or technologically wise, they also need to actually have a partnership with most of the private firms to improve their earth participation in terms of remote sensing, the satellite, um, and innovation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Emeka. Um, I, I also, given that there are no other uh, questions, maybe go back to Tom. Tom's question about um, the power of EO technology for disaster response and management, if there's any guidelines or ethical frameworks to be in place. Um, I know, uh, uh, Lakita, you mentioned a few of those in the presentation. If you want to add any uh, other comments to Tom's uh, question. Lakita. Sorry, I was just reading yeah, this question. Very good. Yeah, <laughs> um, so yes, with regard to guidelines or ethical frameworks, I think um, Emika also touched on this. So the transparency and confidence building measures are key here, I think, um, because as we came across in the research, it's very difficult to um, agree upon a legally binding instrument. So we do need those softer laws. Um, as an initial step. And I think that's where we do need to start. So we've got the principles, we've got the Outer Space Treaty, we've got other key instruments that can inform what we're doing going forward. And the transparency and confidence building measures can come in to support those. Um, and I think that would be it. Do you have any other questions on that? Is that clear? Yes, um, sorry, uh, Rakita, just to add, I think we already have um, some guidelines on framework in place. Um, the only thing we have is that those guidelines are just some um, soft laws, and most of them need more like an update to meet the current realities of time. 
And um, aside that, I think we already have that in stages that we need more like development. We need to develop them through the confidence uh, building measures. So it encompass issues of privacy, issues of security, and the increasing population. Thank you. Thank you, Amika. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we have technically one more minute of Q and A. If anyone has any one last quick question, um, to put it on the chat or to raise your hand. Uh, hey, Lakita. Also, I wanted to add a point for uh, Amika's uh, points. So, hey, everyone. I'm Rishikesh, and I'm from the technical department of uh, the current group. So, basically, regarding uh, Earth Observatory satellites. Uh, so. If you're speaking about uh, sustainable development goals, so there are many points that come in with the help of Earth Observatory satellites, especially when uh, it helps us to manage climate change, it helps us in climate change monitoring, risk management, and a lot of other things, uh, especially water being a very important thing. It helps us track water resource management. It helps us uh, track what, uh, what level of water that has been uh, changed over the years and a lot of things that do come in. I think that's... Uh, a pretty important point that uh, Earth, observat Earth Observatory satellites do play a very important role over there. And I think that's about it from my side. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Thank you again, everyone, for a great presentation and for all the Q&A. Uh, last but not least, we're going to go to our last project with gender equality. Uh, so the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Uh, I think you are on mute. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this brief but crucial exploration into a topic that resonates across continents, gender equality in the African space sector. Um, could you do the next slide? So, yeah, we are two who were dealing with this. That is Joshua and me. That's Rujuka. So, Joshua is my co-lead who couldn't come today due to his classes. Um, next one. So, I would be dealing with the introduction, background, women in the African space sector, gender bias in, uh, in the space sector, the challenges involved, the recommendations, and then I would conclude. So in our journey today, we first acknowledge the historical challenge of gender equality in STEM, not just in Africa, but across the globe. So Africa stands on the brink of unprecedented socio-economic growth compared to the developed regions. However, this growth must be sustainable and inclusive, drawing upon the wealth of its people and the resources. Recently, the UNESCO data paints a stark picture that women are significantly underrepresented in the STEM fields, which only averages to about 28.8%. When we focus our lens on the space sector now, so UNOSA reveals that for over three decades, women have comprised a mere 20% of the space, AV, uh, space and aviation industry, with only 11% of them being astronauts. And the objective today is very clear, that is to present an overview of the current status, the background, discuss the prevailing gender biases, the role of the women in the African space sector, and ultimately recommendations on all those things. So in the next few moments, we embark on a journey to unravel the complexities of gender equality in the African space sector. Now, let's ground our conversation in the legal framework. So Uganda's constitution of the 1995 ensures equal rights for women and men covering work, property ownership, and protection from workplace discrimination. Well, in 2016, only 13 African women engaged in the space activities. Despite the challenges, um, like there were positive shifts which could be seen as more women entered the STEM field, and like efforts in universities and schools actively encourage girls in science and encourage uh, like engineering, which reflects uh, changing societal attitudes. The use of space for the development in Africa presents incredible opportunities, but a coordinated and inclusive approach is needed. Africa can leverage existing space capabilities, such as the New, uh, New Space Africa Conference and the Africa SGC, which fosters to collaboration within the con uh, continent and globally also. So fragmented initiatives like the South Africa's commercial focus and Nigeria's uh, space education efforts exist. 
the challenge is unifying like it is unifying these for a collective force in africa's development uh next slide please yeah thank you so there are urgent need to build awareness among the leaders about the role and benefits of space in the socio economic development especially for the women and girls the space applications offer effective tools for monitoring the environment managing resources providing early warnings and enhancing education and health services the african space industry annual report of 2023 emphasizes empowering women contributing like significantly to the well-being of the families communities and the nations um next slide please thank you now let's uh, like talk about the role of the women in a region where gender discrimination has long persisted women face unique challenges in uh, in accessing the opportunities particularly in the science and technological field as stated by margaret wortham in her book sexism in science and technology she sheds light on the historical male dominance in science forums the space industry too has been male dominated which limits the active involvement of women lowell um, he highlighted that diversity is a crucial is crucial in the space sector and creative ideas and innovation thrive with diverse viewpoints the sector's potential is limited when ideas primarily come from a homogeneous group on the international women's day space in africa recognized 13 remarkable women driving the african space industry abimbola alale from nigeria stands out as the only female head of a major satellite company in africa europe and the middle east Carla Sharpe who is the founder of Africa to Moon she sheds light on the challenges the women face in the aerospace and engineering the industry is still predominantly male dom dominated and lacks a uh, strong female voice employment opportunities are also insufficient like despite the aspirations of many girls to pursue career in the space sector the lack of mentors and role models remain a significant barrier the scarcity of women who have successfully navigated the field hinders young girls ambitions also initiatives like the unosa space for women aim to address these challenges and the journey of women in the african space sector is marked by challenges but also by resilience and determination recognizing the achievements of women in this field is vital and mentorship initiatives like space for women pave the way for a more inclusive and empowered future next slide so now let's just talk about the challenges distinctly like i did address a few earlier but then i'll just be direct to you so limited access to resources so women in africa often face restricted access to crucial resources like educational materials and res uh, research facilities which limits the skill development and professional growth the second is lack of female role models so as i discussed earlier that there are less fem uh, role models uh, female role models and thus mentorship is required so the absence of relatable female figures impact women's confidence and aspirations in pursuing space related careers limiting mot limiting the motivation and the encouragement the third one is disparities in funding opportunities so gender biases in funding allocation lead to unequal access to research grants and financial support which hinders women's participation and their progress and the last one which is the most important one is the gender stereotypes and biases so the deep rooted stereotypes portray women as unsuitable for stem careers discouraging their involvement in the space industry and perpetuating like societal expectations so basically there is like an active need to address these challenges and not only for the promotion of gender equality but also for enhancing the diversity and the innovation in the african space industry um next section please So our research which is conducted by the SGAC SLP group uncovers challenges and proposes strate strategies for positive change. Our findings reveal persistent challenges for women in the African space sector from limited resources and role models to unequal funding and entrenched stereotypes. 
these hurdles hinder progress and uh, widen the gender gap. So the key recommendations would be collaboration and partnership, educational initiatives, space mentorship programs, advocacy for policy change, and systemic change. So the, the first one that is collaboration and partnerships. So collaboration is a key and a collaborative African space sector will accelerate progress and maximize the impact. Second, that is educational initiatives. So promote equal access to resources, mentorship and challenge stereotypes to empower women in the space related careers. The third one, which is space mentorship program. So supportive networks and mentorship programs are crucial for nurturing the female talent and inspiring the next generation. The fourth is advocacy for policy changes. So advocate for workplace policies, ensuring that there's gender equality, there's equal pay and fair recruitment practices. And the last one that is systemic change. So by addressing the cultural biases and lack of inclusiveness in the objectives of the African space sector for a more diverse vision. Um, the opportunities in space, so like, recognize uh, space as a driver for the African development, we can establish a policy framework for a continental space program to ensure accessible benefits for all nations, which contribute to a uh, socioeconomic progress. Uh, like, next slide. So yeah, in conclusion, our project calls for action to address the gender disparities in the African space sector. Through education, mentorship, policy advocacy, and collaboration, we can create an inclusive and equitable uh, industry, propelling both uh, the technological advancement and the societal progress. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for being precisely on time uh, and for a great presentation. Uh, we do have one question from Tom. Uh, how are uh, African women uh, actively included and represented within UN Copius Yanusa to ensure me to ensure meaningful participation and decision making processes and leadership roles? Additionally, what collaborative efforts or specific programs for advancement um, um, of African women in international space sector in UN Copies and UN USA? I know you mentioned Space for Women as one of the programs, but if you want to comment on that. Um, just a minute. Um, so I'm not like quite sure, but I would try to answer. So like the recent developments, the uh, UN Copus and the UNOSA related to the active inclusion and representation of African women in decision making processes and leadership roles in the gender uh, like global space community. So that would be like gender equality initiatives. So many international organizations, including the UN system, have recognized the importance of gender equality and have worked like actively worked towards promoting the meaningful participation. Then there are initiatives which have aimed for promoting them, but I am not aware about the specific details as such. Then there were global gender agenda. So the UN has a broader commitment to gender equality through its uh, sustainable development goals, particularly the goal five, which talks about the gender equality. Um, then, to be honest, I do not have much idea about this, but I could go through and then get back to you. Yeah, so, sounds great. Um, any other questions? Three minutes. All right. Uh, oh, oh sorry. Sorry, I'm I was always just going. Oh, sorry. I'm always oh, late with sorry. my questions. Should I still ask one or no? Uh, no, feel, feel free. We still have two minutes, so feel free to ask. Okay. Uh, um, I just want to ask, in terms of your the recommendations that you suggested, do you have an idea of kind of what would be the highest priority? Is there like a specific recommendation that the rest of the recommendations sort of feed off of? Um, so... I suppose educational initiatives would be the priority one because everything starts from like the schooling and the universities. So if you motivate them from the beginning that you should just like look into this and 
you mentor them in a way which persuades them so probably there will be less gender uh, inequality taking place because women will know how to fight for their rights and what do they want and after that i could go to collaborations and partnerships because if once we start fighting for our rights and what we want and if the government or the other un nations collaborate it would help us further Awesome. I hope I've answered your question. Awesome. Albert, did you have a question? Uh, uh, no, I think uh, uh, Victoria answered it very oh. well. Awesome. Um, we still have a minute and 20 seconds if anyone has one last minute question uh, on the work. Well, the All question right. is that got from Sachin that is does race contribute to the neglect of African women mm. so uh, I am not from Africa first thing so I don't know whether there is some racial discrimination which takes place in the African section all right well yeah of course uh yeah there's there's definitely that race is definitely a huge aspect and one different when different i guess factors compile together um it definitely exacerbates a lot of the uh, uh discrimination a lot of the different uh tools and mechanisms that are needed to solve this issue especially in the space sector so um uh, of course that makes that makes things uh that that definitely adds to the complexity of things um all right well thank you again for a great presentation and i want to make sure everyone can give a big loud uh internal i guess or virtual round of applause for all of our amazing presenters uh that was such a great range of topics so thank you again everyone for your presentations uh with that i'm gonna hand it off to oliver yep thank you thank you very much so uh again thank you everyone who presented uh uh this i our objective with these presentations was to kind of give you an overview of the of the different types of projects that we've carried out um, this year. Uh, so now uh, we are actually going to move on to so what what is next? What do we have planned for next year? Um, our objective for next year is to focus on creating new uh, PG initiatives uh, with that we're going to hear we're, we're going to be hearing uh, from uh, uh, at a later stage, and we want to make sure that we are um we are promoting that internal pg communications through events like these this, this is the first time that we've had kind of a, a, a general assembly of the entire space foreign policy project group um so it's it's, it's really uh yeah. yeah um so i uh so it's 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 something that we've that uh we we do want to prioritize so that everyone who is involved in space foreign policy is aware of what others are doing and what what types of projects we are um uh, we we have going on going on to starting with the leadership so we have new um uh, pg um for the project uh, group coordinators so uh we have um you You've, uh, we've introduced prior Victoria, Anwar, and Nick, who have been helping us throughout the entire year uh, with communications and membership. But uh, we have uh, onboarded recently um, Angelica and Pankash, who are going to be taking care of re co coordinating the research, coordinating the projects. Uh, they'll be able to tell you more about it later. And then we have, uh, of course, David and Demati, who are, who, um, are the event coordinators and who figure out all of the logistics beautifully. I mean, you, you see this this event, uh, they have figured out the logistics, they have made it possible uh, for us all to be here today. Um, of course, uh, we are still going to be having Victoria and Anmol in yeah. communications and they, they have uh, some, some uh, very uh, interesting uh, initiatives coming up. And then finally, uh, Rosa is integrating uh, our team to help Nick, uh, who uh, are still going to be um, taking care of membership and are also going to be coordinating our very uh, our very new initiative. Um, so our very new professional development initiative. With that, um, I will uh, um, give the floor to uh, the different 
coordinator teams or the different coordinators who, who are going to be introducing um, what's next for 2024. So Pankaj uh, or Ikbika, Pankaj, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Oh, perfect. So hi, everyone. Uh, it has been an amazing year for us. So 2022-23 cycle, but now let's move on to what do we have for next year. So from the research end, uh, this year for this cycle, uh, we are going to focus on three or four research topics at max. So that would mean that we'll be creating three or four uh, sub -pro project groups that would be focusing on four different topics. Uh, we are going to make the call for application for all, for all the members uh, on 11th of December uh, 2023 and the membership coordinator would be talking more about it uh, for the application uh, during the application process you the applicants would have the opportunity to also propose uh, new research topics along with some old research topics that we have collected from our old uh, collections uh, and the applicants will also have the opportunity to apply for co-leadership positions and uh, we as research coordinators would be going through the research proposals and applications of people who are applying for research coordinator or uh, sorry co-leadership positions and at the end of the applications and uh, everything uh, we would be deciding on uh, selecting eight co-leads or six co-leads depending on uh, whether we have three project groups or four project groups uh, okay. along with the selection of uh, sorry okay along with the selection of research team members uh, and something to look forward for everyone like this year we noticed that because uh, space law and policy project group is not uh, is not comprised of just people who have legal background but we also have people from technical field engineers everyone so and all these fields have different methods uh, when it comes to research so in order to uh, bridge the gap between conduct of research we are also planning to conduct sessions on how to do legal research and different methodologies. So yeah, that is uh, it from the research coordinator's end. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please feel free. So from the professional development side, um, this is a brand new initiative that we will be introducing for the next cycle and um, we can differentiate somehow these two tracks educational and cultural the educational will focus more on providing you with a list of different opportunities like summer courses you can attend on space and policy um, certain master's degrees if you're interested also scholarships to be able to access this master's degrees with any background uh, as well as internships in different governmental and um, bodies and commercial um, companies for that purpose we are also intending to partner with certain professional associations for either joint events or in order to provide um, people from the slp project group with the possibility to attend these events with some discounts or certain conditions, favorable conditions. And as regards the cultural track, we want you to also be able to enjoy this learning of space loan policy. So we will recommend you with books from a more literature um, uh, component, but also books that deal with different aspects of space commercialization or space in general um, that you may enjoy, as well as also movies or TV shows that may be interested, interesting to you. And um, 
as Pankaj mentioned, we also look forward to organize several webinars on how to research in space and policy for those that do not have this legal policy background because it is important for the work we we are doing here and lastly another initiative that we are designing for this professional development initiative is um, the possibility of coordinating a mentorship program we are aware that SGSC already has one but um, we want to create a more specific one so that you guys can have some assistance in learning about opportunities or in having a specific um, advice from professionals in the field. So this is all for, for this professional development initiative for now. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so we uh, are going to try to have three big primary objectives in 2024. Sorry, that should say objectives, not objects. That's my that's my apologies. Um, so we want to make sure we raise the brand awareness of our project group. Um, we are relatively new in relation to other project groups um, at the SGAC, so we still want to make sure we're getting out there and people know about us. We obviously want to promote all of the amazing research that um, the team has done in 2023, but also that you'll be doing in 2024. And then um, we want to contribute our voice as a community to space law and policy conversations that are ongoing. Um, so we've thought about a couple of different ways that we can do this next year. Um, we did just create an Instagram. We're still getting it off the ground, so it's not as beautiful as it will be next year. Um, but we want to start doing sort of live Q&As on the Instagram. So this can be with our researchers, we'll bring them in, um, just have a question and answer period with me or someone else on the communications team. And then also people can ask questions as well. And then that'll be recorded and it'll live on the platform. So a researcher can, can then use that and they can share it with others if they want to. Of course, we have the blog. Um, we wanna start putting more thought leadership pieces on the blog. So if anyone is has something they really wanna write about that's specific to space law and policy, that's going to be your space to write about it and our team can help you edit that but we really want you guys to tell us what you want to write about and to really take initiative for that um and then x which i still call twitter because i just can't call it x um but we we want to also have you tell us like if you have opinions on things that are going on in space law and policy let us know we'll also be kind of polling the community to see what their opinions are one of the great features of Twitter is the poll feature, and that will also give us a sense of what other people within our community think about certain issues. Um, and then the next thing, which is we're really trying to get one of these out before the end of the year that summarizes what we've all just talked about in this call is a newsletter. So this will probably be either bi-monthly or quarterly. We need to figure out the cadence but this will be a place where we'll kind of have everything that we've been up to in one place. And we wanna send this out to not only old members of the group, but also to all the new members that are coming in. So this is our plan. Um, and in order for us to do this, we really want people to be involved and to be active. So we're really excited to kind of kick this off in 2024. So for uh, the events timeline for next year, we have a couple of events planned. Early mid-January, we're planning the onboarding meeting. As Pankaj mentioned, uh, the recruitment will start uh, the 11th of December. And uh, as previously mentioned by everyone as well, there will be some interactive trainings on academic writing, SGAC policies, code of conduct um, as well. And then towards the end of January, beginning of February, we're planning to do a team building with the project group um, that would be online, just to be clear. Um, we're still working out the details, but uh, we're planning something fun. And then David will uh, talk about the rest of the timeline. Yeah, so uh, we also wanted to organize an update meeting um, around the middle of the cycle, just to maintain that sort of centralized communication. Um, to see how everyone's getting along and to address any sort of questions that have arisen from everyone, um, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page and to maintain that sort of sense of 
community, which I think is one of the real strengths of our project group. And then around this time next year, um, so around end of November, start of December, uh, we'll organize another of these meetings just to provide you with an opportunity to present your work and ask any questions uh, that you might have from the other projects. Um, yeah, so I hope you've enjoyed today and we'll be making sure to do plenty more of that in the future. I guess, Nick, if you're on or. Yeah, sorry, having issues with the mute uh, button there. So uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, being part of this last cycle. Um, we hope that you are interested in being um, uh, in, uh, joining the next cycle. And so with the event today, uh, there's going to be a email coming out on, on Monday um, and just the give everybody a head start. Um, you can go to the chat and I'm going to drop in the application link. Um, and so you can fill that out um, as soon as possible. Uh, the deadline will be Friday, January 5th. We're going to take a few weeks uh, to review applications and sort of get a sense of what research topics, as Pankaj said, that you want to uh, uh, sort of take on next year as research groups. Also, another part of the application process this year is we're asking a little bit more about sort of skills and outputs. So if you want to support these events or communication uh, initiatives with the coordinators or the core leadership team, uh, we'll have opportunities for you to sort of help out with that. Um, we plan on having a onboarding meeting at the end of January. Um, and then sort of kicking things off uh, and having selected topics and then you know, working on these uh, issues through uh, December of 2024. And so that will be sort of the expectation for um, next year's cycle. Same sort of time commitment, um, you know, expecting two to three hours um, for uh, each research team. And if you're taking on a leadership role, expect that to be a little bit more. Um, but we hope that uh, you found this beneficial and that you'll want to continue doing this into next year. All right. So with that, with that being said, we are coming to the end of this um, space law and policy general meeting. Um, I do want to thank everyone who has been involved in organizing this event. Uh, you've done a wonderful job and uh, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to run these events for, for, for a long time. Um, I'm also very thankful to everyone who has participated in this um, in this meeting, who has asked questions, uh, who ha who's been interested in the work of, uh, of, of, of SLP. Um, we are very excited for what is coming um, ne next year. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I don't know, Maya, if you have anything else that you want to add? Yeah, no, again, uh, echoing what you said, thank you all the presenters for the amazing presentations, for everyone who organized the meeting, and uh, for all the folks who attended. Uh, maybe if uh, you go back to the present of, of the membership uh, slide uh, to keep that on for folks uh, to, to have the details uh, uh, over there. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd also like you to help us in spreading the word. So if you know folks who are interested in your universities and your uh, professional communities and friends or folks you know are interested in space law and policy, please send out the link that Nick put on the chat um, in order for them to have an opportunity. Uh, one thing that we I want to emphasize emphasize a lot um, in space law and policy, we are accepting people from all different backgrounds. A big goal of this project group is to allow more uh, people to get interested in space law and policy, to have the skills and the methodologies and uh, the knowledge and references in the community and network needed to thrive within space law and policy, even if you're not from that background. So don't be discouraged if you're not, uh, both Albert and I were not as part of that and, you know, over time uh, develop the skills needed for it. So with that, I want to make sure to leave, you know, the last 10 minutes for Q&A. So if you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, um, including the membership applications and how to join, uh, this is uh, this is the time to ask. So. Uh, Anyone feel free to raise your hands or write on the chat.
sounds like I think while everything's the questions been cute. Are, while the questions are coming in, if there's any questions, mm -hmm. while the questions are coming in, uh, just briefly go to the next slide uh, where you'll be able to see uh, the email address where you can send us any questions that you have after, after this meeting. Uh, we're always happy to help. Uh, please reach out to any uh, of the of the core leadership team uh, if you have any questions. Uh, we're um, available via our space in, uh, SJC email. You can find Maya and 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 my own email uh, on the SJC website. You can uh, you can find us there. Uh, so we'll we'll be happy to take your questions and if there's anything that you feel like we should be aware. Uh, or if, if you have any topics of interest that you would want to see explored in our project group, please, please not hesitate to, to, to let us know. <clears throat> Yep, and, and I do want to emphasize everyone who was part of our group this year, you are welcome to, you know, send in your application and continue with our group next year. Um, and you yeah. can pick a totally different research topic that uh, is very different than what you started on this year. So, uh, uh, again, we're opening it up for, for everyone. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, yeah, whether you can reach us out over email, over social media, over um, the general SJC email, but hopefully this presentation gave you a sense of the type of work that's been done. Um, and with all the initiatives happening next year, again, you'll have, you'll have an opportunity to participate not only in the research topics, but also in events coordination and professional development efforts and partnerships, um, et cetera, and space law and policy. So um, the... So the world is open for a lot of for a lot of opportunities there. Um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna yeah we're gonna stay here till 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 noon so or like in the next seven minutes so feel free to um, ask questions as you as we go. Otherwise, thank you all for joining uh, for joining our uh, uh, presentations today. Uh, and it's been really a pleasure to just see things wrapped up with everyone's work. Um, and it's really valuable to, to everyone who was part of the cycle to also know what's been going on and the other projects and what the research has been. So I hope that has been helpful for, for everyone. <laughs>